Okay. So um, before I go into Teilhard de Chardin's uh, thought, let me write this name because this is a little bit complicated. And uh, I need to explain why I'm going to be talking about this guy, right? <laughs> because you're expecting Shati or Senghor and here we have this new guy. So let me summarize briefly what we did last time so you can be, we can all be on the same page. And then we'll go into Teilhard de Chardin's uh, thought. So um, we'll be doing two authors, right? Like I said, and uh, we'll be doing uh, Senghor, who, was, uh, who is a Senegalese writer, and Shati, who is a South African writer. They're both, um, well, Senghor is not so much a philosopher as he is a, a novelist or a, an essayist, but he definitely is doing pioneering work. And of course, Shati is a philosopher and he's also doing uh, some work, pioneering work. So, so the, the main thing that we talked about was how we're going to be shifting paradigms now, right? We were in the context of Western thought and we were talking, you know, they all kind of build on each other. Now we, we have basically new, no foundation, right? This is new. This is uh, the, the very first pioneers of um, not African thought, obviously, because that has been going on for centuries in the stories and the legends and even the dances, right? You have philosophical ideas being expressed, but African philosophy, that is to say, systematized with philosophical language, that is Western language, this is new. And Senghor and Shati are the pioneers. Now, they're coming from different backgrounds than the philosophers that we've been doing. Shati will be trying to bring together African concepts with Aquinas's philosophy, right? So, and he's not difficult to follow. The difficulty will be Senghor because what he's doing is actually building on the, the thought of this person we're gonna study today, which is Teilhard de Chardin, right? So he's actually going to find the philosophical uh, system that, that best supports his, uh, the African notions he's trying to teach, he's gonna find that system in a Teilhard de Chardin's thought. Okay, just like Levinas, remember how Levinas had these ideas and then he found Husserl's phenomenology and he was like, oh, this is the best language for what I'm trying to express. I'm gonna then, I'm gonna work within this language, within this framework, <clears throat> right? And so Levinas is writing in the context of phenomenology, although he's stretching the concepts and so forth. So Senghor is going to really build or in a way found his, a lot of the ideas he's trying to bring to the public from uh, which are African concepts. He's going to find the foundation of these ideas in Teilhard de Chardin's uh, system. Okay. So everybody clear so far of the connection between Senghor and Teilhard de Chardin? Uh, put your hand in the screen if you're following. Right? Okay, great. So who is Teilhard de Chardin, right? Just a few words on, on him. So he's actually a priest, but he was also a scientist and he was an evolutionary scientist. So he's thinking within the context of evolution. Um, and so, which of course at the time and st even still today is considered to be uh, the science, right? Uh, with regards to human origins and, and what it means to be human and so forth. So, so he's, so Teilhard de Chardin is really kind of developing the, this notion of evolution, but he's going to add a lot. It's an extremely original thought, right? Théâtre de Chardin for me is, was so stimulating, right? Um, you don't even have to believe in evolution to follow what he's saying, <laughs> right? He's really, really a, an imaginative uh, thinker. So he's basically thinking philosophically about evolution, right? He's He's not doing science in the sense that he's, you know, over there uh, looking for sediments and fossils, right? He's, he's, he's philosophizing, reflecting on this scientific framework of evolution. And this is giving rise to certain ideas which are founded in the science, but which, of course, none of us have ever heard about, I think. <laughs> it was new for me. So we have to get this down good because Senghor is going to build on this. This is the, cons this is the, the framework that Senghor is going to use to transmit the African concepts in a language that Europeans can understand, right? This is the, the medium through which Senghor wants to express some of these African concepts, right? Okay. Just a few words on Senghor, in case you, you forgot, right? Senghor, first president of Senegal, but also thinker, novelist, poet, right? 
Um, and of course, both him and Shati will have this kind of similar view of the, of the human subject that we saw already with Levinas and Buber, this notion of the subject as profoundly relational, we're going to see again, but discussed in a completely different manner, right? Um, good. All right. Um, so because we have a lot to cover, let's go straight into uh, Teilhard de Chardin's uh, philosophy. So this is based, what I'm going to tell you today in the chapter I did for you, is based on this amazing work called The Phenomenon of Man, which I really suggest you read quickly, right? I mean, I skimmed through some of the passages because he was going into fossils and stuff, but it's really an interesting read, uh, especially the chapter that I've uh, 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 uploaded for you, right? That particular chapter, in my view, is pure genius, right? It's really worth reading. We're going to go over the all of this work together, I'm going to bring up all of the ideas which make up the totality of the work, The Phenomenon of Man. But the main, main, the climax is in the chapters that I've uh, uploaded for you. Okay, so two main ideas in Teilhard de Chardin. Number one, from simplicity to complexity. Number two, is it? <laughs> from matter to consciousness. Okay. So again, right, this is philosophy of science, right? He's philosophizing about the science. He's not pretending to do science, but he's reflecting on the science of the time. So he's going one step further, right? Beyond the observations, he's interpreting, he's reflecting, he's philosophizing, and a lot of interesting ideas are coming out of that. Okay, so, um, so first thing that uh, the phenomenon of man, so the phenomenon of man is really a study of evolution, right? We know that we have, according to the science, or where we are today in science, we, we have evolved, right, from a, a tiny, tiny micro, what do you call it, uh, one-celled being, I forgot how to say that scientifically, right? The tiny little one bacteria slowly complexified became the first fish and then the first amphibian and then the first... I guess bird, <laughs> I don't know, I forgot how it works. Eventually, right, becomes more and more complex and we have now the human being, right? Now, what, what Théard de Chardin is going to be thinking is, are we in the highest level of evolution? Is the human being the end? Or is there a further step we need to take? This is where it's going to become interesting, right? Uh, now, I'm, every time I'm teaching this class, I'm competing with a fleet of airplanes, so I'm going to shut my window. I'll be right back. Okay, so hopefully this will be better. <laughs> All right. I live close to LaGuardia. <laughs> and I miss the COVID days when there were no planes in the sky. <laughs> okay. All right, so, so we, he's commenting on this, right, movement from the simple to the complex, right? And he's reflecting on what is the next step for us as a humanity? Where are we headed? What's the, where is the vector pointing, right? And so he's going to talk about, first of all, this idea from simplicity com to complexity. And then he's going to talk about how we have evolved also from matter to higher and higher levels of consciousness, right? And he's going to talk about that. Okay, so let's start with this notion of from simplicity to complexity. Okay, so he is going to talk about two ways that we have become more and more complex, right? There are two kinds of uh, forces at work in in the evolutionary process, right? These are both forces of attraction, right? In order for a bacteria to become more complex or anything to exist, it has to attract atoms, right? Cells, right? So there is, so he's talking about two ways that we become complex. There is two forces at play and he calls them, I'm gonna write it down, the tangential energy and the radial energy. Okay, so let's go over this, these two technical terms, which you'll find throughout the work, right? Tangential energy is simply the energy within matter, which attracts matter to matter and creates more and more complex beings. So for example, you have uh, in nature, right? You might have 
I don't even know, I don't even remember my chemistry, but you have certain atoms that attract other atoms, right? So you do have this constant attraction, which creates more and more complex beings. This kind of material attraction, right? Natural attraction between different cells and different, between the atom and so forth. He calls simply this energy which attracts in order to make uh, um, a complex of molecules. He calls this the tangential energy. Okay, everybody clear on this first one? Uh, put your hand in the screen. Okay, now the radial energy is a little more um, <laughs> out there, but you'll understand it very well if you understand Aristotle's teleological cause. Let me write this down, Aristotle's teleological cause. In other words, yeah, we become more complex, but what pushes us to do that, right? Why do we sense, why do we have the impulse to become ever more complex? What makes us want to even do that, right? Why don't we just stay just one cell? <laughs> what makes us want to become ever more complex? And this he calls the radial energy. This is simply the energy which uh, this is a, equivalent to the teleological cause, right? There's an energy that draws us towards complexity. Right? There is something that makes us want to become more and more complex. So it's not just about doom, 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 right? Why is there even, right, in order to go from simplicity to complexity? Okay, bottom line is <laughs> we are going from simple to complex, <laughs> okay? And there's something that is attracting molecules together in a more and more complex way, right? Um, so, um, I, I have a few quotes, but you don't have them in your text, so I'm not even going to uh, read them. But ultimately, what he ends up saying is that, you know, this attractive energy, which, which brings the, the molecules together in order to make ever more complex organisms, he calls love, right? So he has a really interesting view that love, in a way, is not just a romantic feeling between people. There's not, it's not just people that are attracted. Everything in the universe is attracted. Every cell, every atom has, there's this force on every level of the cosmos. This attractive force is not just between human beings, it's between molecules, between cells, between, right, uh, between uh, different, um, uh, of course, animals and so forth until we get to us, right? So he's saying basically the whole universe is put together by a single attractive force and this force he calls love right are we all good so far are you following this this interpretation of evolution put your hand in the screen okay so that's where you'll get these notions of love let me read you a quote um from from the text you don't have that one but um maybe you do um this is on page 264 which I think you have. Um, do you? <laughs> do you have page 64 in your thing? 164, sorry, 164. Uh, someone say something? <laughs> uh, no, our starts on 237. Okay, that's fine. Then I'll read about myself. Okay, so just in answer to Kim, right, this notion of gravity. So gravity is only between us and the earth, right? But the, the force that brings us together as molecules, right? Why does the atom, right, stay connected to the electron, <laughs> right? Why are they not, you know, all over the place? Why is there this kind of, you know, do you have the, the, the not the atom connected to the electron, the, the, how do you call it, the proton, and then you have the electron, right, and you have in there attracted right so the basic um uh, material blocks are already kind of complexes that are attracted to each other am i making sense kim kim where are you answer me kim yeah um i just i'm just wondering if um so this is all from tehard de chardin right yes he, did, did he have I, I know as an evolutionary scientist did he have any kind of like what what era did he live in because i feel like he he's kind of ignoring like physics or he's ignoring the scientific aspect of why things attract 
Uh, yeah, he's no, he's living right at the beginning of quantum physics, right? So he's aware of that. So, I mean, what is attracting the electron to the, to the a core of the atom, right? It's not gravity per se, right? What is attracting one cell to another, right? When you have a carbon attracting to a hydrogen, what is it? Why are they putting together, right? Why? So it's more than the force of gravity, right? This is, there is, or I mean, you could call it that, but there's certainly a force that is created an attraction. That's the idea, whatever you choose to call it, right? Um, King, you have a question? I just want to throw in my two cents into the question of physics. Um, there are four types of forces, the strong and weak nuclear force, uh, electromagnetic force and gravitational force, um, all of which, uh, to my understanding, we don't understand why um, they are. Um, it's just that, you know, they have certain qualities and characteristics that we could observe, but we don't understand what, you know, makes them attract to each other. Um, I think we should all just suspend our disbelief as it is now and just take in um, everything he has to say because we shouldn't get caught up in nuances of, of the physics because it's, it's just an example. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying, King, because uh, remember, Théodore Chardin is a visionary. We, we have to see him like that, right? Don't, don't get into the, the little, oh, there's this detail he got wrong and this detail he got wrong, right? He's not doing physics. He's a visionary who is, who is in a way, as a philosopher of science, he's sensing where the science could go. I know we're not used to this in our culture. We just do science, right? But you, you have also philosophers who can envision where the science can go next, right? And so we have to see him not so much as a scientist, you know, with exact, you know, he's saying exact truths following the data. He's envisioning where we could be going, right? So in a way, uh, King is very right. Let's, let's give him the space to talk, right? Let's keep an open mind, see where he's going, because he is certainly going to give an interesting direction to where science could go or is going, right? He's doing philosophy of science. He's not doing science. What he's noticing is that there is a force of attraction in the universe, whether it's several forces like King is saying, or just one, it doesn't matter. There is a force of attraction, <laughs> right? And he's saying, well, this force of attraction looks very much to me like love. Basically, he's saying the force which is at the basis of all life is love, which is an interesting uh, perspective, right? It's an interesting uh, interpretation of the science, right? Which is what he's doing. Right? There is, we only think all forces of attraction and we don't even move beyond, but what is love other than a force of attraction, right? So basically he's saying that what puts the universe together, what creates life is this force of love, which is bringing together, right? Am I making more sense? Uh, Kim and King, are you um, following what I'm saying? Okay, great, okay. <laughs> All right, very good. So, okay, so that's uh, okay. Let me read that really quick. Let's see how much time I have. Yes, okay. So, I'm going to just read from my text um, on page 264. Wait, don't you have 264? 264, you have, right? Yeah, we have it. You had said 164. Yeah, I was wrong. <laughs> 264. Here you have the chapter called Love as Energy, right? Go to the second paragraph there. This is a very interesting idea, right? Remember, he's philosophizing, right? He's interpreting the science. So he's saying this, we are accustomed. Are you there? Put your hand in the screen if you're there. Okay, great. We are accustomed to consider only the sentimental face of love, the joy, the miseries it causes us, right? Um, and then going on to the second paragraph, considered in its full biological reality, love, that is to say, uh, the affinity of being with being is not peculiar to man. So he's saying there is an affinity in nature. Atoms are coming together, becoming more and more complex and leading to higher forms of life, which are constantly, right, more and more complex, meaning there is an agglomeration of atoms and cells, right? And what is bringing this together? Love, right? He calls it love. It is a general property of all life and as such it embraces in its varieties and degrees all the forms successively adopted by organized matter, right? So, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It, it, by the way, it rejoins um, the, 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 um, uh, the observations of Indian philosophy, right? Which say the same thing. At the basis of reality, there is love, right? 
interesting. Okay, so um, that's just a detail, right? It's not exactly now we're going to get now into the part which Sango is going to um, use. Okay, so, f so first thing we saw, right? From simple to complex through the force of attraction, right? This is how we go from simple to complex through this force of attraction that brings matter into ever more complex uh, beings. And this force of attraction, why not give it the word name love, right? But now, second thing he's going to notice and philosophize about and reflect upon is this evolution at the same time that we are getting more complex. Listen very carefully. Let me say it again. At the same time that we're getting more complex, he notices we are becoming more conscious. As though there is a connection between higher complexity and higher consciousness. This is key idea for the rest of the two weeks. Let me say it again. The more complex, the more conscious, the more you have this conscious energy. And it's true, right? We are the most complex, right? Forms of being. We are also the most conscious, right? And the apes are right behind us, <laughs> right? So now this is very interesting and you'll see why in a second. Uh, it's, it's actually extremely brilliant where he's going. I just, I, I can't, I, I, I can't bear it. It's so interesting. Okay, so, uh, so let me continue. So he's, let, let's get a quote on that. Um, 244, this one you have, I think. 244. Okay. Uh, go to paragraph one, two, three, four. Um, it starts with mega synthesis. Who is there? Put your hand in the screen. Okay. So he's talking about this here, right? Mega synthesis in the tangential. Remember, tangential is this force which brings everything together. And therefore, and thereby a leap forward of the radial energies along the principal axis of evolution. Now, the part you want to remember is ever more complexity and thus ever more consciousness. Now, this is interesting because he now there are ramifications of this. And this is where he becomes extremely interesting. Read this. If that is what really happens, what more do we need to convince ourselves of the vital error hidden in the depths of any doctrine of isolation? Right? In other words, the more conglomerated we are, the more conscious we are, right? And so isolation clearly is going to be, you're going to feel it's good. If you are not in a conglomerate, you lose some of the consciousness. Now, let me anticipate and then we'll, we'll get there, right? Let me ask this question, right? We're moving from simple to complex. As we're moving from simple to complex, we're moving from no consciousness to higher consciousness. Now, what's the next step of evolution? What's higher, what's even more complex than the human being? Anybody know? Let's see if you can anticipate what he's going to say. Anybody want to guess? What's, what's the highest complexity? Sosa, go ahead. Give it a try. <laughs> I want to assume it would be like God, possibly. Something that's bigger than a human being. Except we don't. <laughs> we can't see. There's no way of telling. <laughs> but yeah, yes, yeah. You're on the right track, though. Okay, Kang, speak to us. Go ahead. Sorry, guys, who raised your hands. <laughs> Kang, oh, go ahead. Um, just a collection of human beings. Exactly. This is so extraordinary, right? The highest, so since we're going to complexity and complexity is, is more conscious, the more complex we get. Well, when meaning, if we begin to form society, now we are at the higher next step of complexity. There is a lot of us together. And what's, uh, what's his name? Chardin is saying is that at that moment, higher level of consciousness, which means that community is the next stage of evolution. The capacity to bring together people right, in a, in a communal or community setting to bring together not only people, but nations, we're going to see with Senghor, right, is what constitutes the next evolutionary leap, is the next evolutionary dimension, right, because, and at that point, he says, at that moment, we will have an explosion of consciousness, even more than what we have right now as individuals, right, everybody following this absolutely brilliant idea, <laughs> put your hand in the screen, if you're seeing what I'm saying, okay, anybody have questions about what I just said, that I need to clarify before we get in the quotes, um, I mean, are you measure, you have to measure how fabulous this is if you're Senghor, right? Remember, Senghor wants to argue uh, this uh, typically African idea that the community 
right, is the highest form of our humanity, right? He's in, in the Western thought, the individual is the highest form, right? Senghor is saying, no, it's the individual in community that is the highest form, right? And so imagine his joy, right? To be reading Teilhard de Chardin and be like, oh my God, I have the evolutionary basis to what I'm trying to say, right? Teilhard de Chardin has just shown that the highest level of, of man, of humanity is community, right? So a Senghor who's trying to show that it is man in community, which is the highest level of, of consciousness of humanity than the man by himself is certainly going to be thrilled at this moment, right? Kim, go ahead, ask your question. Um, so I guess my question would be, um, what about communities that we've already created? So we have nations, we have our own cultures, we have like, is that, have we already achieved that level of evolution? Absolutely, we've achieved it partially, but we are still separate nations, right? And even within the collectivities, we are still separate individuals. We have a kind of fake community. We're going to see today how that is, right? We have a collection of individuals. We don't have true community. We're going to see why that is the case, right? Well, let me begin by saying, right, true community, every individual is in a way participating fully Today in our societies, we only have an elite which is participating fully, right? Which is part of making the decisions and which is really flourishing. What, what Senghor and Teilhard de Chardin are both saying is that to have this higher, this higher level of consciousness, every molecule has to function, right? This is when you have the, the, this, this bigger a complex being, right? You can't have a big complex being with a bunch of deficient molecules, not gonna work. Every molecule has to be pumping, right? And the problem with our societies is that only three or four molecules are pumping. The rest are dead, <laughs> right? And that's why they're saying we need to pump every, every molecule has to be fully flourishing for us to reach this higher level of, of consciousness, for us to really be a complex uh, being. Does that make sense, Kim? Yes, okay, good. Um, <laughs> good, all right. So now let's go into the quotes to see a little bit what, 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 how he says this. And this is all in your text. Um, okay. So we see already, right, we're reading already on 237, right? The, the, so now he's going, after having said this, right, that the highest level of evolution is society, right? And that, that the highest level means that this is where we will reach the highest level of consciousness. He's now going to a comment on the ramifications of this uh, idea, scientific idea, right? He's going to comment on the ramifications on the way we are experiencing society today. He's going to criticize our, the way we do society today based on this model, right? So he's gonna say here on page 237, go to the top, one man, are you there? Wave at me, okay. When man has realized that he carries the world's fortunes in himself, right? Absolutely. And that a limitless future stretches before him in which he cannot founder, his first reflex often leads him along the dangerous course of seeking fulfillment in isolation. This is the West, right? We believe that we can find fulfillment in isolation. As long as I make it to the top, I'm good. What I'm not realizing is that if I make it to the top by myself and I'm not reaching a higher level of complexity, I am still going to be conch, a, 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 a poor in spirit, to use the terms of Jesus. Right? I'm not going to have as much consciousness as I could have if I was part of a community. I'm by myself. So I have, yeah, I have me. I'm pretty good myself, right? I, I'm a big complex being, but I could be so much better off. I could have so much higher level of consciousness if I was part of a community. So that's the idea that he's getting to. Go to page uh, 238. Another crazy idea. Uh, let's see what Sosa says. <laughs> yes, Sosa, that's the idea. <laughs> Uh, second thing that he's going to criticize, so first of all, he criticizes the individualism of our society. So he's saying, yeah, we have society, right, to answer Kim. We have society, but it's not a real society because everyone is still by himself. There is not yet a real complex being with, you know, 
uh, everything working together. It's just a, a mountain of different individualities, right? He's going to also criticize this idea of the superiority of certain races. Go to page 238, second paragraph, less theoretical. Are you there? Put your hand in the screen. Okay. Less theoretical and less extreme, but all the more insidious is another doctrine of progress by isolation. We are right, we have been right here last four years, right? Isolationism. America first, right? We're gonna progress in isolation, cut ourselves off, and then we'll be better off. We don't have to pour all this money in all these stupid organizations, right? We can progress better in isolation. And he's criticizing this. He's saying, which at the very moment, by the way, is fascinating large sections of mankind, the doctrine of the selection and election of races. So he's saying, again, this, uh, this idea that as a country, you can be in the highest level of your success in isolation is also wrong because you're missing the higher level of consciousness you could have if you were cooperating, if you were in a communal setting as a nation. Everything clear so far? Put the hand in the screen, any question? Okay, so very strong criticism of American values, right? Whether it's individualistic values or the isolationist values we have been experiencing. We, uh, periodically, we have this as a country, we want to be by ourselves, right? And we're not the only ones, the UK, right? England went through a crisis like this. The whole uh, European continent is constantly dealing with people wanting to be, ah, I'm done with this Europe project, I wanna be by myself, right? Say, no, you're devolving. <laughs> you're not evolving when you do that. Okay, uh, other, other quote now coming to page 244, back to page 244 where we were reading the rest of the quote. Um, so, um, yeah. Did you see where we left off uh, the vital error in the depths of any doctrine of isolation? Put your hand in the screen if you see where we left off. Okay, continuing. The egocentric ideal of a future reserved for those who have managed to attain egoistically the extremity of everyone for himself is false and against nature. It's interesting, right? The idea that I can succeed on my own without any connection is against nature, he says, right? This is not, right? Progress occurs through complexification, not through isolation. Continuing, no element, and this is interesting, no element could move and grow except with and by all the others with itself. And then he gives an example in nature. Uh, also false and against nature is the racial idea of one, this is interesting, especially for us, of one branch draining off for itself alone all the sap of the tree and rising over the death of the other branches. This is where we are today in our society. We have an elite of people who are doing well, and then you have the rest, <laughs> who by the way, in our country, is not so much more a racial divide anymore because you have both whites and blacks who are left behind, right? So we have this idea that, oh, we're gonna get at the top and the rest, you know, whatever, they'll figure it out. Uh, he's saying this, this is, this is, and we can take all the sap for ourselves and leave nothing for the others. He's saying this is not good even for us. Why? To reach the sun, nothing less is required than the combined growth of the entire foliage. In other words, the strength of the sap, the strength of the tree depends on how many leaves are receiving the sun, right? If there's only three leaves receiving the sun, the tree will die, right? You have to have every single leaf receiving its dose of sun for the tree as a whole to be strong and therefore to bring back its strength into the leaves, right? So that's what he's saying. If only a few of us are drinking the sun and the rest are withering away, we are weakening the whole tree and thereby weakening ourselves. That's the idea here, right? Um, okay, continuing still next paragraph. The outcome of the world, the gates of the future. You see how he's a visionary, right? The entry into the superhuman. These are not thrown open to a few of the privileged nor to one chosen people to the exclusion of all others. They will open only to an advance of all together in a direction in which all together can join and find completion in a spiritual renovation of the earth. He's almost prophetic there, right? A renovation, etc. Et right. So this is the idea. We will reach the next level of evolution through complexification, 
we can only reach complexification by making the next step, taking the next leap into community, genuine community within the nation and community between the nations, right? That's the idea. Now, um, so, so far, so good. Any questions so far? Because there's one more idea I need to talk about. <laughs> but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. So any issues, discussion, objections uh, that you need to point out at this time? <laughs> oh yeah, you're all convinced? Let me see your faces. <laughs> we good, this is it. We, everybody's now, uh, we're moving towards a happy world, hand in hand. <laughs> okay, now here's a concern that one of you brought up in the reading assignment, which is a legitimate concern, right? And this is a typical objection that we as Westerners have, right? This, 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 um, this irrational fear of what we call socialism, right? So let's talk a little bit about that, right? Because he's talking about community. Is he talking about a socialist model, right? Like the Soviet Union had for a while, right? And like, I think Russia still has to a certain degree, right? Is he, is, so we as Americans, right? Anytime we hear community, right, society, we start to think, oh man, I'm gonna lose my individuality, I'm gonna lose my creativity, I'm going to become a cog in the system, right? I'm, I'm going to be, right? We have this fear, which is legitimate because it's happened, of losing one's individuality in the collective. This is why as Americans, we resist all forms of socialism, community, communitarianism, right? We are, we are allergic to this. <laughs> I mean, even in the, in the present struggle with masks, right? People are like, I'm not going to wear a mask. And I'm going to be me. <laughs> right? I'm going to have my freedom. Why, why I got to do this, right? There's a kind of um, obliviousness, right? To, or, or at least resistance to any type of communitarian, collective, right, approach. Because we are afraid of losing something in the collectivity, right? So, let, so make sure you write this down, right? That what, what, what's saying, what, what Chardin is saying is all very nice, right? That the highest level of complexification is society and society's highest level of consciousness, right? But we have this deep-seated fear of losing something to the collectivity. And we are, we are by the way, uh, not crazy to think like that because we have seen it happen in the USSR, right? We saw how Stalin, for instance, um, did his thing by uh, how we see this even in China to a certain degree, right? This idea that, well, you know, you need to blend. <laughs> you can't be over here having crazy thoughts or crazy religious beliefs, right? You need to blend. So, uh, so we are legitimately af afraid, right? And I think uh, Hal Murad, you were the one who brought up this, this problem, right? So now here is the cherry on the cake, the way he explains it. So he goes back to biology to address this problem, right? And he says, well, let's look at biology. What happens to the individual cells when they become ever more complex? Okay, are you guys ready for this biology lesson? Everybody good? <laughs> okay, so he takes the, the, the example of the, of the egg when it's fertilized, right? First it's just the egg, and then it becomes more and more complex. What happened to the individual cells? Anybody know as the organism grows and become more complex? What happens to all of the individual cells? Where are my biology majors? <laughs> do, they, do they stay all the same? In other words, do we have like a blob of identical cells as the baby gets bigger? Is it just a big blob of identical cells? What's happening to the cells as the baby is growing? What's the word we use? <laughs> Who knows the answer? Where am I? Doesn't yes, it just it. fall out? Differentiate. Uh, yes, excellent. Who said that? And Paul Kim also. Me. Who, who's me? <laughs> they own me. Ah, hello. Like at least me. <laughs> yes, absolutely, right? Absolutely. This is so interesting. As the baby complexifies, the cells, instead of losing their individuality, gain it. This is so fascinating. Right, what we see in biology, which, which, which in a way, Théa de Chardin is saying we should follow the model of biology in the way we build our societies. And so as the organism complexifies, the cells differentiate ever more as it becomes more complex, 
the cells become more unique okay the bigger the organism the more unique the cells so let me write this down as the organism organism complexifies the cells differentiate right and like also like kim said they specialize right differentiate so he's saying actually and we'll see this with shati in a couple of weeks this this idea that being part of a community actually makes us unique it's per, it's it's precisely when we are part of a greater whole that we find our true self which we saw with livingness already right let me say that again it is in as much as we as can't write we are part of a greater whole that we become truly ourselves right um so and this is what he calls community versus collectivity uh, we'll see that with Senghor, right so so this is very interesting the idea that as we enter a communal state as we enter the state of the highest uh, complexification we are not losing our identity we are gaining it right at least if we follow the model of nature now sadly we don't follow the model of nature <laughs> right when many societies they want to make everyone the same cell right we don't we don't allow our societies to organically evolve maybe that's the problem right we want to impose society to be x y and z instead of allowing the society to organically go towards ever greater differentiation of its parts right so that's the idea which we're going to see when we do uh, shati how this actually functions literally how do does an individual become truly unique only when they enter society they find themselves they find their name only in the context of their connection to the society not by themselves right uh, so let's read the last quote on this um do i have it yeah 262 okay Yes, third paragraph in any domain. Are you there? Put your hand in the screen. Okay, good. In any domain, whether it be the cells of a body, the members of a society, or the elements of a spiritual synthesis, this is the key, union differentiates. This is in biology, not in the USSR, <laughs> right? In biology, it's like this. So what Théa de Chardin is saying, let's try and follow the example of biology and see if we can build societies like that, right? Rather than this kind of, you know, a, a parody of what a society should look like. In every organized whole, the parts perfect themselves and fulfill themselves, right? And that's the idea here that he's talking about. Going now to... You can continue reading, but going to the last paragraph. Uh, thus, under the influence of these two factors, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, the only fashion in which we could correctly express the final state of a world undergoing psychical concentration would be a system where unity coincides with a paroxysm of harmonized complexity. So the ideal society, the society which follows the model of nature, is a society which is which has unity in difference right in other words the difference is acknowledged as a vital part of the unity the differences between the parts are a vital part of that unity so this is what he's saying we should if we want to reach this higher level of evolution right this is the type of society we need to start building right okay good i did it <laughs> i explained the de chardin in one hour Okay, any questions <laughs> or comments? Uh, Professor, I have a question just regarding the, uh, the homework. Sure. I don't mean to, <laughs> to be that kid. Uh, so Wednesday's homework is what was due today, correct? Let me think. <laughs> Wednesday, we didn't have class. There was no homework. You don't homework. have class this Wednesday? I was sick, remember? I mean, no, we I'm talking about this Wednesday. <laughs> oh this coming wednesday yeah yeah because it's veterans day so, too yeah don't don't think about the past because the past was a mess now we're going to the future so i'm going to post uh the reading by Sangor tonight for wednesday 
right? So, so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to read this text, but you don't need to do an assignment on it. Just read the chapter that we've just gone over. So you have okay. a good basis in Théâtre de Chardin. The reading assignment will be on Senghor. And it's okay. a text I'm going to put up tonight. And that's what will be. And then the next reading assignment will be in the book, uh, The Philosophy of Shati, which I'll tell you the pages. So I'm going to put it all in the syllabus tonight. And then I'm going to put all the texts on Blackboard. I'm going to organize everything tonight. OK, thank you. Yeah, and I'll put um, an announcement also, because it's, it's been unclear. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, good. Um, OK, so Bella has a question. <laughs> Um, so she's talking about controlled burns. So for the health of the forest, you have to set on fire little parts of it and so forth, right? <laughs> what does this mean? We have to kill a few people occasionally. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, I mean, any society obviously has part of it that is dying and part of it that continues to live. So this is part of normal nature, right? Even in our societies, we have this. So you can argue that we are following, right? Uh, and perhaps this idea of, of um, <laughs> keeping too many people on life support is not a good idea, perhaps <laughs> based on this model, right? You could say. Uh, any other questions? Um, good. All right. So please try to make up uh, King. Go ahead, King. I actually think the control burn um, uh, comparison still holds up to um, what Salgo is saying in that um, the trees that uh are meant to burn they're they're pretty res fire resistant so um they're not in much danger and like with different parts of the body if um a toxin is building up like you know having to defecate to urinate or sleep um from um building up i i don't know the specific toxin that that builds up in your brain but through you know our faculties we have to get rid of those those toxic buildups and like with the forest, you have to get rid of um, the debris being the leaves um, through a fire. And the trees have grown to resist fires. And we shouldn't look at the fire as such a negative thing. As you know, we've, we've grown to know that it is dangerous and it, it's a harm to us. But for the tree, it's, it's not as dangerous to them. And it's, it's a necessity like with, you know, these processes of um, getting rid of toxic buildup. So if um, in that society... I can't think of a good example. Um, if like, you know, bad, you know, vibes is going around, then you, you got to do something to get rid of it. And it doesn't have to be necessarily to the um, detriment of the society, but something must be done to get rid of, you know, the bad things. Yeah, absolutely. Right. We have, we used to have the tradition of exile for our criminals, right? <laughs> Get rid of the criminals in that way. Um, so, and I mean, also age, right? The natural deaths that, you know, we bury our dead. It's a similar process, right? Absolutely. Um, Allegre, you want to say something? Oh yeah, I was going to go off of what King said, because it makes sense. Like, if you just look fire as a way of like, I guess, cleansing the toxin, it's actually like, I'm pretty much a good thing, because you like it. Like if we take it literally, like it burns the way to like the old traditions and the borders of what we have. The borders we have are just like political borders. They don't re represent like what we truly are. And what we truly are is like more of a community than like separate nations. Yeah, that's where they're going, right? Also Senghor, this idea that let's stop thinking that I can progress in isolation from you, right? Actually, it's when we get together that we can really get somewhere, right? That's, that's kind of a new idea in our age of uh, increased nationalism, right? You have this notion, more and more countries are saying we want to be on our own, right? We don't want to be dependent or contribute, right? We are one of the first ones to be like this. Um, so, and even, and we feel even within our own borders, we don't need everybody to be doing fine. We feel like the elite can do good without these guys. Not true. Right? You can't really have this next level unless all the entities are cooperating and part of this next level, right? So we'll talk about this with Senghor. Um, good, all right. So really try to assimilate this text by Chardin because that's the basis for both Senghor and Shati, right? This is the, this is the, um, the system, the language within which Senghor has chosen to philosophize, right? So that will help us to really see 
the scientific foundation for what he's trying to argue. All right, great, we'll call it a day. Um, so your next assignment, just to be clear, is a text by Sengor that I will upload tonight. <laughs> Please also do the other reading assignment, put them in separate folders, right? You have a folder for Sengor, folder for Shati, page one to 34. And then, because I want you to read, uh, there's three things you have to read <laughs> by next time. Let me write them down. You have to read 1 to 34 by Shati, which is the general introduction to the class. You have to read uh, this text, right, by Chardin, which I uploaded that we just talked about. And you have to read the new Senghor text, which is called, what is it called? Uh, Negritude and African Socialism, which I'll put up tonight. Okay, so those are the three things you need to read by next time. And you need also, right, please watch the video, <laughs> the lecture on Sunday, the Sunday lecture, right? This is your other assignment. And finally, what's the last thing? The reading assignments. You have two reading assignments that I'd like you to do. So you have a lot of work between <laughs> today and Wednesday. Uh, you have two reading assignments. You have the first shati, right? And the uh, coming up Sengor. So yeah, by Wednesday. Yeah, try to get up to date because otherwise you'll fall more and more behind, right? So try to be up to date by Wednesday. I'm sorry it's all squeezed like this, <laughs> um, but try to do it so that you can be, we can then progress again as a class. Okay, so let's call it a day. You guys can go, whoever needs to stay can stay. Um, but the rest of you can go and I'll see you in a couple days. So who's first? Pario? <laughs> I just wanted to be that person, sorry, and ask when you might have um, my test graded. I did hand it, I put it in the folder last night. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm trying to do it, like, I'm behind too, like, <laughs> this time of the semester is, is crazy, but yeah, I, my goal is to read every morning, to get some tests done every morning, so this morning I couldn't because I was scrambling for class, as you can see, <laughs> but I'll get there, yeah, I want to read it uh, as soon as possible. Okay, no problem, no mm -hmm. rush, I was just checking in, thank you. Good. Thank you, Pario. Uh, why is she? Okay, Allegra? <laughs> so we have two reading assignments, right? But we have to read four different things. Three. Three. So we're reading three different. No, wait. Is it? Should we have to read the Chateau Chardin, uh, Senghor, and then we have to watch the Sunday's lecture? That's four. Yeah, well, that's watching. That's not reading. <laughs> <laughs> that's you know, that's almost the same thing. But so so we yeah. so okay. So two reading assignments and three different texts. Okay. Um, one more thing. How about what? A, so how are we gonna do the podcast? Oh my god, the podcast! Um, what? I forgot about it. Yeah. What? As soon as I get like myself back on track, <laughs> and we're gonna talk about that. Yeah, that's gonna be remember one of one philosopher that you pick. We're gonna talk yeah. about which one when we're pretty much done. And then you will do you will interview this philosopher on a podcast, like kind of like Cornell West does in his podcast. Uh, check him out. Oh. West, mm -hmm. we write his name down. Um, no, I, I remember from last time. I think from yesterday. Remember? Okay, yeah. And yeah. then you'll just ask Cornel them West. questions about current events and see um, what they would answer from their philosophy, from their particular. So you embody the philosopher, you dress up like the philosopher, and then you interview them. And it's how do you wait? How do you dress oh. up? Like, do I need to get a suit then and just like and put a? That's who you decide to be. <laughs> Oh, that seems like a lot of dress work for something to have to be interviewed with. Okay, so also one more thing for the for the I guess for the what was it called for the for today. So so it's better that we exist as community because the next is evolution, right? Yeah. Okay, so I mean you could easily relate this to like very certain types of I think ideologies like anarcho-syndicalism or anarcho-communist. 
or can yeah. it white can be com like comics in general because this is all like yeah. a collection so he talks just about yeah he you'll read Senghor he talks about socialism but he says our socialism African socialism is different from the USSR socialism because yeah. we don't have this blend and this merging of identity in the collectivity we have mm -hmm. the organic version where you become fully yourself in community right so he he is talking about a new brand of socialism which is 